Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Below the Yellow Line. It's been a while, I feel like, at least since we've had a guest in our virtual studio, but we have another one with us today, our Caminard Series driver, Will Kimmel. Will, thank you for taking the time to join the show today. How are you doing? Doing good, staying busy, and uh, <laughs> just trying to get ready to go to our next couple races here. That's great. That's great. Um, before you were driving in ARCA, before you made starts in the NASCAR Cup Series, you know, you weren't just born and immediately put into a cup car, right? Every driver has a, a ladder. They have to progress up. What is your story? How did you get started in racing and how did you kind of climb the rungs of that proverbial ladder? We, uh, I started racing when I was 10, so I was kind of on that. I don't know. We we're probably the generation that kind of started racing earlier and earlier, you know, as, as a, it's very popular now, but 10 to 14 ran mini cups, uh, ran one year legend cars and then, uh, went straight to Salem speedway in a, uh, super stock, which was, uh, you know, 600 horsepower, eight inch treaded tire. Um, kind of like the street stocks now, but had a better body on it. They were pretty fast. Um, two years in late model and then the bottom fell out. Um, literally, uh, the account when the economy crashed and dad and Frank went out on their own, um, I pretty much had to walk away, not walk away, but pretty much step away and slow down a whole lot there from. 08 to 12 we we just didn't do a whole lot um we ran some street stock stuff we won the rockingham race um and then from from 12 on we've done a little bit of everything anything from from late models to street stocks to uh, the truck series to xfinity series to cup series uh, a lot of arca stuff in there um just kind of all over the board to be honest um ever since then you mentioned uh, Frank, and of course, that is the great Frank Kimmel, a 10-time ARCA champion. That number still doesn't seem real. Um, what is it like to have someone like him? Then you mentioned your dad, too. What is it like to come from a racing family and kind of always have a mentor to lean on? You know, if you're having trouble with the setup or having trouble with a car, you can just call your dad, call your uncle, say, hey, you know, what would you do to combat this? You know, what is it like having somebody like that that's at the racetrack with you or maybe just a phone call, a conversation away from from helping you? It it It's awesome. I mean, um, you don't know any different when you grow up doing this deal. And, um, you know, we're kind of like the last of a dying breed here. We we race on a national touring level and that's that's all we do. We don't we don't have uh, any other income. This is this is it. So you know, all of us kind of know what it takes to do this. Um, I'm third generation. My grandpa started in uh, 49. This is our 75th year. So there's a lot that goes into this. Um, and it's so much, you know, it's so much performance based and having the run at Charlotte definitely helps, but it's, a uh, it's a tough deal, but you got, you know, I get, like I said, like you say, I got dad, uh, Frank's always a phone call away, but you know, me and dad are the ones that, uh, that pretty much keep the shop going here. Um, we got one full-time employee, Zach Hunter comes in about two or three days a week, um, as, as part-time and, and that's it. So it's, uh, it's a lot, well, there's some overhead here, you know, you got to keep guys working and stuff, but, uh, it's hard to do on the Arca stuff, but we're going to keep our heads down. We're gonna keep going. You mentioned your grandfather started in 1949. Is there kind of a, a pressure, I guess, because, I mean, you know, NASCAR celebrated their 75th anniversary last year. You guys have been around as long as NASCAR have uh, mm -hmm. has. You've been racing on a national touring level with Arca stuff. Is there a, kind of a pressure? You know, this isn't something you guys do for fun. You mentioned it. This is your income. This is your nine to five. Uh, is there a pressure to keep that going and to keep not just getting to the racetrack, but winning and, and adding more trophies is, you know, all the ones we see behind you there. Well, you, you definitely want to win. Yeah. It's nice behind me. And then you got like, this is, <laughs> this is definitely an arc of drop back. Cause you got it. Like it looks really nice in the middle. And then you got our plastic totes on the end. <laughs> Classy. Um, but you always want to do good. Like you, you want to win, you know, that's, that doesn't come from anything with my family. Like I I'm, I'm super competitive. Anything I do, um, it, it's bad. Um, my <laughs> wife hates it, but that's just the way it is. You know, I'm, I'm the dad on the side of the soccer field telling William to go hard. I'm telling we, uh, Waylon to watch, you know, watch the ball when he's playing T-ball, uh, just doesn't matter what we do. We want to win. So that, uh, that's definitely a driving factor, but at the same time, um, you want to make pop proud dad proud you want to do those guys justice for for the foundation they've laid um there's i don't put a lot of pressure on myself to keep the deal going i just want to keep it going um for myself and um uh, pop and dad both though they they both understood now uh, pop's no longer with us he passed away four years ago but he was a money man like tried and true he knew what we were doing and you know he 
he wouldn't have, uh, I wouldn't say he w- would have walked away at this point for, for how the business has changed, but he, he probably would have looked at it a lot different with, um, how rides are rented and it's not so much about the talent level as much as it is how deep your pockets are. And that's, that's mm-hmm. probably what would have irritated that it did irritate pop probably more than anything, <laughs> um, towards the end there. So that's kind of where we're at. Uh, but obviously you want to keep it going. My son, William, he's seven, he's racing go-karts and quarter midgets now. So, um, it's a great plan to be broke for life. I'll tell you that. <laughs> well, you mentioned it there. Um, you know, this the way things have changed. And I think, you know, it's always interesting to hear people say, you know, this is what Dale learned harder or somebody would have thought about all the changes made to NASCAR, made to racing. How much have you seen it change? I mean, your uncle, your dad, they've seen it change way more. How much have things changed in the industry? Because like you said, to get a top ARCA ride nowadays, I mean, I, everybody in there is talented. You can't come anywhere near a race car like that at a national level without having an insane amount of talent. But it does seem at times there are drivers out there that it's like, wow, they have a ride over them. They have, you know, and you look at why, oh, it's because they have a company or, you know, maybe their uncle has a company, something like that. How much have you seen it change? Just the quality of the competition out there. Not that everybody out there, but a few guys are bad, but it's just changed the way you get a ride and and how you keep a ride, how you retain a ride has changed. How much have you seen the sport change in, you know, the three decades or so that you've been around? It, it's funny you say it. There's so many things that come to mind when you say, how much have you seen it change? Because I'm, I'm 36. So I'm, I'm older in comparison to like the guys that are 18 and 19 coming into it, you know, but I'm really not that old in the grand scheme of things for as long as I've, I've been doing it. I'm not like patting myself on the back. I don't mean to do that, but my first race was Pocono in 01. Uh, we blew three motors that weekend. That was the tri-state motorsport days. That was the Vance auto parts days. We had it going on man like i mean we had seven or eight guys full time in the shop um and i come into that not knowing what we had right you know you you just like oh i'm 10 11 years old i'm going to the racetrack and this is our race team um so you see that we have a sponsor uh that was a little over right around 1.2 million a year basically from 98 to what was our last year? Oh, seven, oh, six, oh, seven, somewhere in there. So the money was there. Um, and it wasn't because we were renting rides. That was, that was Larry Clement's team. He had a sponsor, Frank drove. Dad was a crew chief. It was ran out of new Albany. It was a very old school in today's terms, um, organization. That's how it ran. And then coal binding wasn't around. The cars weren't on the ground. The motors were open. That's a whole nother conversation, but you know, you're sitting here talking about what changed with the drivers, I got to ride with Mark Gibson in 2010. I got to run, uh, I believe it was three races we ran or two races. I got to run Pocono in Iowa that I remember. I think it was just two, but I got, I got to run those just because, you know, me and Mark had a good relationship when we got to do that. But um, as time has progressed, it's, you know, sponsor crash clause, you know, who's paying for tires, you know, and there's so many people out there willing to front that money at this point. And you can't be mad about it. That's just, if you want to race, that's the way it is right now. And I don't know if it ever go back the other way, but that's, that's how we've seen it progress. And if, if you got the money, you can race enough at, at all, all these various levels to make yourself competitive. Um, if you want it bad enough, you know, so, um, you can't be mad about that. You know, it's, it's Ty Gibbs has taken every advantage as he has, and he absolutely should. There's no reason to be mad at Ty Gibbs or be upset because of what he's got. He can drive a race car. It's, he's proven it. He runs well. He's taken advantage of his situation. So uh, there, there's multiple ways to look at it, but uh, I've seen it all the way from old school racing all the way up to, you know, how it is now. Well, I think that's a great point that you make. You know, everybody, I, I guess, complained is the right word. You'll see people on social media wherever say, how did that guy get a ride? And they'll go, they'll go win like Ty Gibbs did that year when he just whipped everybody in Arca. Now he's in the NASCAR Cup Series and he's a playoff contender. You know, yeah, maybe they got in that ride because of their name or money. But if you're opportunistic like he is and you take advantage, I mean, it doesn't matter how you got in the race car. If you're producing results, I think at the end of the day, that's what matters in sports. Doesn't matter how you get there; it's it's how you perform. Um, so I think you make a good point there that you know it is hard to be mad at these people. Hey, it's just the situation they were given, just like it's the situation, you know, you were given and, right. and the situation, you know, Brad Smith, Ryan Roulette, Michael, I'm just, you know, throwing out names, right. you know, just the situations they were given. 
they've taken advantage of the opportunities. And I think that's what makes a series like ARCA great because not everybody has a unique story. You know, nowadays, every cup driver you ask, when did you start racing? Go-karts when I was five. Go-karts when I was five. Go-karts when I was five. And it just seems in ARCA, everybody's stories are so diverse and everybody came up a different way like that. So that's a really good point that you make. Um, I want to try not to jeopardize you with this next question. I understand if you can't answer it, but I've heard so <laughs> many great stories from the mid 2000s and late 90s at ARCA. Kind of seems like the golden era if you talk to a lot of people from that era. Depends on you who you talk any, to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> for, for us, yes. For everybody racing your uncle, probably not. But for yeah, everybody right. uh, Nate, with the last name Kimmel, probably so. Um, do you have any, I guess, shop stories, talking shop stories? Are, are there any uh, questionable parts or any issues regarding legality of cars, That any stories like that that you think could tell? Any secrets that maybe would be okay to not uh, – that your uncle wouldn't get mad at you for sharing? No, he – Frank don't remember. <laughs> Ain't no way. You see his Daytona wreck in Pocono? He said his head so many times. Uh, <laughs> no, that's that's one. Th uh, man, we ha we had there was a lot of good times. Uh, the thing is, we, you know, we uh, the guys at the shop they they didn't they didn't raise me, but they definitely shaped me. Like there was there was a group, and when I start saying these names, you're gonna know who these guys are. Uh, Brian Wilson just won on Sunday with Austin Cendrick. Um, he was in the shop you know, there for, I think it was two or three years. Um, uh, Jeff Stankiewicz, he's with, uh, with the nine truck now. And he was with, I can't remember. Oh, he was with, uh, Sheldon Creed last year on RCR as a, a crew chief. Um, these guys, uh, Travis Mack was one of them. These guys, like they didn't have to put up with me. I was 12 years old. That's probably as annoying as can be. Um, but we had a lot of, a lot of good times. Um, and, and it wasn't so much about like, the cars being legal, you know, when you have that type of money, you buy new cars, you buy the new shocks, you buy, I mean, our motors were fresh from Joe Ryan. I think the motor bill was somewhere in the $400,000 range, pretty much all the way through, um, up until 06. We didn't go without motors. Um, but you know, that's the thing you had guys in there that wanted to go further on, on the mechanic side of work, crew chief side of work. Um, and, and they did, um, they working around those guys showed me like the intensity that I needed to work on. And I think that's kind of what sh some of it has shaped me in, in here in, in the garage and how I work. Um, at the same time, they were really hard on you. Um, you had to have super thick skin and that's probably why it's only me, Zach. And I think Hunter's only part-time cause he can only put up with his part-time, but, um, it, you know, there, there's a, there's a way that, that they kind of just, um, I don't know, just kind of brought me through there with them. And they really didn't like, like I said, they didn't have to do, it. I was just a crew chief son and, and I didn't try to play that part. I just tried to like, you know, we blew through mo three motors at Pocono that day. And, um, you know, I, I got to break clean and clean underneath the car. You know, I had to do that type of work, which I was fine with. I, I understood the level of seniority and where I was at. And I was totally fine with that, uh, learning from all those types of guys, but you know, as far as how they were running at that point, um, obviously dad being the crew chief, I knew a lot what was going on because I was heavily involved in not heavily, but I, I knew the terminology. I knew how things were being set up and I knew what he was doing. And it was just, you know, they were spending money. They were spending big dollars. Um, and that's one thing you can do. We've it's tried and true. You can cheat or you can spend the money. And, um, you know, we were spending a lot of money at that point, new car every year. Well, I think it worked out, you know, you, you, all those trophies behind you. I'm sure there's there's more, um, but all those championships, I think, I don't know, what was it, eight in a row, something like that? Seven or eight in a row? Seven. Seven. Oh, seven. It was okay. It was uh, 2000, 98. Uh, he won his first one. Dad wasn't there yet. 99 was his, uh, he ran second to Baird. And then uh, 2000 to, oh, I think it was 07. And then 08, we went out and Kimmel Racing was formed back again with uh, help of Ford. Uh, Ford come in and we got a bunch of Roush cars. We finished third that year. That was the stent house. Um, Scott speed incident. At oh, Toledo. Yeah. That was yeah. big. That was big. So show oh my, my age now, but that's, <laughs> that, I mean, that's just how it was. I mean, that's, uh, that was the, the Arca series was, was, was pretty thick at that point. That is just an incredible, I'm, I'm trying to imagine when we had Jimmy Johnson's run from 2006 to 2010. I can't think of a run that's been had like that in the Bush series or the Trek series where it's just, just uttered, not dominate that's decimation at that point not even domination that's just 
eight straight years. And, you know, you mentioned the one year you didn't win the championship, you finished second in that span, which is just, that's incredible as well. Um, well Got off I, to I, a really rough start at Daytona. Um, yeah, yeah. No, no rebound rules on, Chica- on shocks, and they locked the, the rear shocks all the way down. So when Frank Ooh. lost it, the rear tires were off the ground, frame rails yep. hit the ground, away she went. And that was that was a tough, tough start there. Yeah, well, I, I think it worked out for the better. I, would, would you trade that one wreck in for those, uh, what, seven championships in a row? You'd have you to ask him. Probably, probably so, because that was a that was a big <laughs> lick when his when his head went up against the wall. It wasn't. It probably was not what he wanted to happen. No, probably not. Probably not. Um, I'm trying to think here. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if we're ever going to see a run like that because now the difference in Arkin now is that and you mentioned all those young kids. Like most of them, they're either out of the sport or they're in a truck ride, an Xfinity ride, or a Cup ride right. within five years. I mean, there's. I mean, the, and the veterans now, like, it's unfortunate. Most of the veterans now, they're not getting access to the top stuff. Like, they the, just, it's just prospects, thing, prospects, you're having, prospects. You're having to run ARCA to get approved for NASCAR. You know, they're they're yeah. looking past ARCA, and that's not what I'm, that's not what I'm here to do. I'm, I yeah. want to stay ARCA team. I want to build, I want to build us back. Um, like, I think we can be, and I, I think, I think if we had some help, I think we could do it for, probably less money than what we did back then. Um, just because the, the motor were, were restricted everywhere. So your, your motors don't get hurt nearly as bad. Um, and there's some things that you can work around, um, and try to make it work on, a, on a little bit lesser of a budget. Um, still going to be a tall order to handle the, the 18, the 82, the 28 and, um, the 20 car, you know, whichever, whichever car Avenger any puts their, <laughs> puts their full, full deal on, you know what I'm saying? You know, other, yeah. the other seats are kind of open. So, yeah. um, it's hard to get that consistency, but th- those guys are tough. That's a, that's a big, big organizations to go up against, but I have no intentions to go anywhere else. I wanted to be with Kimmel racing and I want to build us back like we were. Well, you mentioned there ARCA kind of being a step to get approved by a NASCAR. So obviously NASCAR thought enough of you and, and you were a good enough driver. You get tapped to run some cup races. And I know I think you only ran two or three of them, but still yep. hardly anybody on this planet can say they've run NASCAR cup series races. It's a whole different breed. Um, and yeah. you, you talk about all those guys that were in the shop with, you, you know, Brian Wilson, I was covering the race in St. Louis this weekend. And, you know, I asked him in the press conference. Uh, I, I don't remember what I asked him, but his answer sounded, I mean, it was a championship caliber answer. And I don't doubt that some of that information that, that he learned, um, that he's learned now, you know, Penske was gleaned from, from his time with you guys. Um, but what is it like, you know, on a cup series race day when you're not a spectator, but a driver, what is it like waking up in the morning saying, I'm going to go race against Jeff Gordon, Carl Edwards, Kyle Busch, you know, just the list goes on and on of champions, hall of famers, you know, were, were you nervous? Were you? Did you feel like you were a veteran behind the wheel at that point, and you could you could handle it? Were you nervous? You know, just take us through your mindset on those during those starts. The, the biggest thing I had to do was I needed to get my like nutrition and my my cardio up because that's uh, I'll never forget the mile and a half for two hundred sixty seven laps, and we only run a hundred in our race, you know. So that was it was over double the race um, in a, in a car that makes. Um, quite a bit more horsepower than what I was used to. Uh, other than that, it wasn't that big a deal. Um, the biggest thing was, you know, I was running in 32 car equipment matters and mm-hmm. Archie, Archie treated me great. Um, and me and Archie ran together in 2011, um, in the Xfinity race, it was the nationwide series at Kentucky. We qualified 15th and, and weren't expected to do that. Um, I overdrove the car, drove in over my head, lost it and tore a car up that he couldn't really afford to lose. Um, so I didn't understand, you know, I didn't understand at that point what my role was. And when I went to Kentucky and went back with Archie and Mason, I understood like these guys don't need to know I'm even here. So, I don't need to get, they don't, when, when they got, when they showed their nose or when they had a run on me, I backed up a half a car, went to the top. I gave everybody plenty of room. Like I did not want them to say, did you see Will Kimmel out there? Mm-mm. No. Um, finish the race, keep the car clean. Uh, we were able to do that. Kentucky We finished like 36 to 37th. Same thing at Kansas. Um, got to see the Joey Logano, Matt Kenseth incident at Kansas because they lapped me coming down the front stretch right before they did that. And I was like, this isn't the best time. I don't want to arc a brakes this year and just absolutely drive through these guys. So that was, uh, that was, that was probably the most exciting thing we had done. 
uh, had to had to get through at the cup race, but it was just getting to the end of the races and trying to keep all you know all the fenders on the car. And like I said, respect those guys because I'm only here for two races and and get out of here clean and just uh, that that was it. I mean, it's, it's it's really as simple as that, as simple as it could sound, I guess. You did have the best seat in the house for that Logano Kansas deal. Of course, that kind of became the the story of the season, uh, right. as, as the as the uh, the chase went on. But yeah, that, that was an incredible time to be a NASCAR fan. Um, you mentioned ARCA breaks there, and I, and I want to ask you as somebody that's been around that series for a long time. <laughs> as a, uh, I, I'm only 18 years old, so I, I'm I'm that part of the internet, that part of the NASCAR fan base that is uh, just obsessed with memes, and. Arca breaks is probably the biggest NASCAR meme out there. Yeah. And I was talking to Ryan roulette before Daytona this year on the show. And he said, I really hope this is the year we start dispelling some of those rumors. And we start kind of turning the Arca series, you know, back into a series that has a lot of respect because I think, you know, especially among younger fans who didn't get to see the days of your uncle and, and all these other great drivers that were in that series, Arca has kind of become a joke because, most of the highlights you see are 16 year olds running into each other, or, you know, Arca breaks or Andy Janconiak saying, I'm either going to see God or the checkered flag, you know, just stuff like that, that maybe isn't the yeah. best representation of the series as a whole. Do you feel like Arca can and will get back to a point where it is seen as, as not maybe a joke, not, you know, I don't think it is. I think that's just a person. No, I, under, I understand. Um, 100%, I understand 100% what you're saying. You're not going to yeah. believe me. You're not going to hurt my feelings. Trust me. <laughs> um, if you heard what was said in the shop, it definitely can't go on air. Um, <laughs> however, I'll, I'll say it like, I'll say it like this. I, I know what it looks like from the outside. Everybody can see the highlights, you know, it's different though, when you're involved in the series and you see the amount of work, the quality of cars, um, and the, the money that's spent in this series is, is unbelievable. Um, there's, there's not going to be a lot of people that are just going to come in here and, and, you know, you can, I'm just talking off out of pocket here. You're not going to see a lot of people come in here and just run through these guys, especially like the, the, the numbers I talked about earlier, you know, 18, 82, 20, that bunch. You're not going to do it. They spend a ton of money. They have a ton of technology. They got simulation, uh, pull down chassis dyno. Um, they got a lot of stuff at their disposal. And I know it kind of looks like a joke or a, a great meme. I understand that. But when at the end of the day, the Arca series is ultra competitive in that top five or six cars. Um, and when I'm talking to him, I should, I should definitely mention the two and the six because the, the rev racing diversity with a NASCAR deal, they are no slashes. They are absolutely a competitor. They showed it. They, they led laps at Charlotte. They were, a, they're, they're strong every week. So, you know, when you look at it like that and you look at it from competitive side, the memes are funny and, and some of it is deserved because, it, it shouldn't happen. I 100% agree with that. Um, but there's definitely two sides of that. And I think ARCA is definitely on its way back to being super competitive because even when we watch a truck race at Daytona, that doesn't go as planned um, some nights either because we were pretty late this year too. Um, I don't remember what the green flag laps were, but it was that was a lengthy one as well. Um, but nonetheless, same deal there super super nice equipment and uh, it's not from a lack of effort um but it's a stepping stone series so these guys don't have experience the closing rate you know we're a football field a second at a place like charlotte daytona talladega the closing rate is phenomenal especially when we have the lap cars out there um and there's nothing wrong with that those guys deserve to be there as much as anybody they're paying their dues they're trying to do it um and they're trying to stay out of the way they don't want to tear their stuff up um but the differences in speed, I mean, that's kind of what makes the Arca series the Arca series. So um, definitely see both sides of it for sure. Well, that's what I was telling Ryan. That's what I was trying to to tell a PSA to our listeners is like, man, Arca is not, you know, it, it really isn't a joke. And I, I love getting perspectives from, you know, guys like Ryan, a guy like him who's, you know, he's only part time. I think he's, you know, he, he only runs maybe half the races and a lot. Of, that's what a lot of these guys, these veterans are doing. Uh, is maybe run you know half the races or something like that, but everybody in that series pays their dues. I think more so than you know a lot of drivers in maybe even Trucker Xfinity because I think the big difference is when you have maybe a one-off driver in ARCA, a veteran, you know maybe somebody like yourself, they don't just run a race or two and dip. You know I I can't count on one hand. Um, you know there's just an insane amount of drivers that I remember that have run one or two races in Trucker Xfinity like the last just two or three seasons. And I haven't heard a peep from them since. And it's kind of like, 
Why, why don't you come back? The thing I love about ARCA, you'll see somebody run a race, and then they're back. If they're not back every week, they're back at least half the time. And that's what I love about this series is that it is a stepping stone series, but it's also a series for people just to settle down. And they're either going to build into a championship program or they're just going to be about the happiest people you've ever seen because they love what they do. Right. And um, that's the great, like that is the great thing about ARCA is that there are, you know, in the cup series, it's just everybody all out. But I feel like it's almost the same as the truck series where you have veterans like Grant Enfinger, Matt Crafton that are there, you know, just trying to win a championship every year. And then there are the guys trying to, you know, step up to the cup series one day and, and trying to work their way at the ladder. So, uh, I think that's the thing that people don't understand about ARCA is that it's not just a bunch of, you know, fools running around out there. Everybody deserves to be there each and every week. Absolutely. Um, so that that's the great thing about the series. Uh, my last question for you. Um, you mentioned, you alluded a, a little bit earlier about how you want to grow Kimmel Racing kind of back in, I, I guess, into a superpower. And the Hendrick of, of ARCA, I guess we'll say, uh, for the for the sake of, right. um, you know, but... Uh, what what are the steps to that? What are, you know, just pen and paper in 2024, I guess going into 2025, what are these steps you need to take to turn, you know, start Kimmel Racing where it is right now, which is a pretty good spot, and build it back into a championship contender every week, you know, title winning program? It it it's not going to be overnight and it won't be it it may it may not be even in a year or two probably. Yeah. Um First things I, I'd like to do is I'd, I'd like to get, you know, a solid, a solid sponsor. Um, and that's, that's easily said, but that's, that's what we got to do. And we've made ourselves more visible on uh, social media and trying to push that, um, that Jake, that's who you were uh, talking with. And Jake's pushing my social media really, really hard. And he's done a great job with uh, content at the racetrack right now. So we're trying to get um, stuff started up that way. Um, and, and then the finishes are just, bonuses right now you know the, the charlotte deal was just a bonus um to run that well so we're trying to capitalize on that then we're trying to you know obviously get eyes on us to to secure a sponsor i'd love to see us run you know get back to that six to eight race um comfortable deal to where we can we can take that and and build and not jump full into a a full deal because when you run a full deal, the money goes way, way up because you've now got to have people in the shop to turn these things around. Um, that's what, that's when, that's where it gets tough. I mean, you're in, if you start going every other week or every weekend um, and you got the travel and all that, you know, that's, that requires easily another two to three people in the shop. And that's two to three really good people. That's not, um, that's not six or seven mediocre. That's two or three people that can, that can get with it with a wrench and, and, and pull engines and swap engines and set up and all, I mean, just get with it. Um, so that has to be done. I I've got to do a better job of reaching out to these sponsors and, and trying to, trying to do that myself because I'm who they want to hear from because right now Kimmel racing's, you know, me and dad, but dad's a little older at this point and I'm going to end up being the, the lead deal here. So I've got to take a little more initiative and, it's kind of hard to do that right now because like this morning I had to mount a seat in our car. So I'm making the brackets and fixing the rails and getting all the stuff, uh, fabbed up, welded up. And, uh, it's hard to wear the the sponsorship hat when I'm doing the fabrication, the setup front end geometry, and then hop in the truck, drive the toter to the track. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of moving parts for myself to do that. Um, so that's where I've got to find a way to make that work. And, uh, you kind of got to invest in yourself and that's what we've done. We've kind of bet on ourselves with the social media thing and trying to get this thing going a little bit, but um, that's kind of what, that's kind of what it looks like for me right now. And that's um, it's tough, but at the end of the deal, deal uh, end of the day, I, I want to race. Like that's really what I want to do. Um, I've missed terribly. I'm, I know I'm getting long winded here, but I'm going to say it. I've missed terribly racing the cars on the mile and a half that, I, I really, really enjoy that. That's my absolute favorite thing to do, except run Salem. I like the dirts. I still want to do those three races, but I'd love to do all the intermediates um, and show up and win there. There's just nothing quite like staying on the gas and driving that thing down on the turn. Um, is about as far, as far as your butt will let you. Um, so that's, that's what I want to work back to. That's what I really enjoy doing. And, um, you know, 
Charlotte kind of solidified that for me as far as the direction I want to go. We've slowed down on the street stock stuff. I haven't raced my street stock uh, last year. I didn't run it. I'm not going to run it this year again. And um, just really going to try to emphasize the ARCA stuff and and stay up with that because if you want to run with those guys, you've got to you've got to build your program. You got to stay after it. So that's what uh, that's what the plan is. Well, you certainly wish you the best of luck with that. And yeah, hey, congratulations on your fourth place finish at Charlotte. That was a huge deal for you guys. And you, know, yep. you look so happy getting out of that car. And I was thinking. You must I mean, have seen me like 10 minutes after I got out of the car because <laughs> I don't know what I look like when I got out. Well, it, it was a little warm. So, hey, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't I don't, blame you at all for that. I'd probably look the same way. I'd look that way after, you know, running qualifying, two laps in qualifying. I get out yeah. of the car just sweating like a dog. Um, but congratulations for that. And uh, we certainly wish you the best of luck. Um, where, where can everybody find you on, on social media and, and maybe an email if anybody does want to reach out and, and maybe propose a sponsorship to you guys? So our, our email is office at Kimmel Racing. It goes right into our, um, our obviously our office. Um, then uh, Kimmel Racing's on Instagram, Kimmel Racing on uh, Facebook, and then uh, there's a there's Will Kimmel on Instagram as well. So those are all the the outlets you need to check out to uh, keep up with us. And like I said, when we race on the weekends, and we'll have some stuff about once a week from the shop, but when we go out on the weekends, um, there's a lot of content pushed and a lot of stuff that you're going to see behind the scenes because um, we're not a big organization and if we show it, it's, it's, it's just part of the deal. It's, 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 it's a little bit more raw than what, uh, what most put out. So that being said, um, check us out and I appreciate you having me on the show.